What's going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Before we start, I'd love it if you could give us a little subscribe, give us a little comment if you like this episode. It means the world to me, and it makes the podcast go along one hundred percent more than if it if you don't. <laughs> Uh, this week on the podcast, I sat down with the one and only James Hype. James has had an amazing career, um, releasing music since 2016 on SoundCloud before that. Um, he's been around in the industry for years and seems to just be like up in gear every time. Um, everything that he puts out is gold. Everything that he does on socials is gold. He's just one of those artists that just seems to get most things right. And it's absolutely amazing to see from the outside. Um, he released the record Ferrari which then completely changed his life um, he was extremely successful beforehand and now he's just on another level of success so bumped into him in the airport um, nearly a year ago I guess or seven months ago um, after EDC and asked him to come to the podcast and we finally made it happen so without further ado James Hype Mr. James Hype how are you man? I'm very good bro thank you whereabouts in the world are you? Um, I'm in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Nice. And, um, what time is it? 6 p.m. Ah, oh, that's a good time, actually. Where are you? It's 10 a.m. I'm in the UK at the moment. Oh, okay. Yeah, 10 a.m. here. What are you doing out there? Holiday? Vacation? Touring? I did a, did a festival here, like, two days ago, and then I've yeah. got a couple of days off until the next weekend when I'm doing some more stuff in, in still in Asia. Nice, man. How many people do you tour with now? So on this tour, I've got uh, two video guys and yeah. a tour manager, and my missus is here as well. But she's <laughs> she's just enjoying it, you know. It's chilling, chilling. Yeah. Do you um? How long has it been since you've been touring with somebody, or have you always toured with somebody? Well, going back like five years or even more, I used to yeah. tour with, with I used to tour with one of my best mates from Liverpool and. Like we lived together, we toured together, we did everything together. So I was I was quite fortunate that I had someone with me, even when yeah. I wasn't really making very much money, you know. Yeah, it's always handy that, right? Yeah, yeah. You've always been like really forward, forward facing on social media. Um, I remember, I can't remember when it was. It was it was a few years ago when you first started, um, or not. You probably started way before I noticed what you were doing. Um, but you were always very like it was DJ foot focused, very mm. DJ focused, and very like edits, DJs, like mashups, like DJ skills, kind of like almost like a like a DMC scratch artist, if you know what I mean. You, you, but kind of like the modern day version of it. Yeah. <laughs> where did where did that come from? Well, honestly, I used to be a, I used to be a hip hop DJ and an open format DJ and all of these things before I. Before I really doubled down on house music, so yeah. that was that was sort of a natural way for me to play, and I guess I realised at one point that I had to commit to a genre in order to really take what I was doing anywhere. And I'd always had a love for house music, so I was like, okay, yeah. this is me now. I'm house. <laughs> what? But what was that though? Like, what, I want to get to like how was that process for you was to like actually decide okay, I'm going to do house and I'm going to be the guy that does this. Because there's nobody else that does it, if you know what I mean. The only other, per the only other person that I think that, can, that has, like, in the house world, that has similar skills to you, although, yeah, it came from hip-hop, is A-Track. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I hear that. Um, well, I think I started... I started being all in on house because that was what I was making. Like when I, mm. I, I, I DJed for a long time before I ever made music. And yeah. when I started making music, I, I found myself drawn to, drawn to 909 and stuff, you know, and it, it just ended up being, it felt right. I'm also from Liverpool. And whenever, <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when you go on a night out in Liverpool, so you hear 95% of the clubs play house music. Yeah, that makes sense. Your first release, 2016? That's uh, 17, I think. Wait For Me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah okay, yeah. I, I shouldn't have written that one off. <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was, that the, was that the first one? I think it was, yeah. I think before that, I was doing SoundCloud for a long time, you know, and 
getting uh, getting my SoundCloud account deleted every couple of weeks and you know for uh, copyright infringements and yeah, yeah that, it's I think back that was though now right SoundCloud's what? back. So this is what I've been hearing. I started re- I started posting things on there again because I was I was totally off it. I was just uploading to YouTube for yeah. kind of edits and stuff. But yeah, it's back and. I'm really interested to see what it does, but yeah, I still think you get the like infringements, but I think people are just a lot less like, you don't get banned for doing it. If that yeah, makes yeah, sense. Yeah, you can't yeah. monetize it, which makes sense. Yeah. I remember there was, there was one time when I, SoundCloud was my everything, you know, I used to upload a, used to upload a bootleg VIP remix like once a week and I got three strikes and my account got deleted and I remember the pain that day and I built up like, <laughs> Built up like fifty thousand followers on there, and it hurt, man. Hurt for like three days. Yeah, I can imagine that being a a, t- a tough one. I, <laughs> it's weird. I've, you and I are like almost completely the opposite of like, <laughs> in that sense. Because I, ne- I'm always too, I'm always trying to be too like, um, what's the word, strategic, mm. about my career. And I don't think it necessarily helps to a certain extent. I think there's a certain level of like, just fucking upload shit. Are, are you and, a bit of an, over, an overthinker? Yeah, and I and I'm an over planner, and and I'm if I don't plan everything specifically, it I, it doesn't work for me. See, I'm so impatient that I yeah. have to, when I finish like a, a record, I'm like, all right. There you go. It's out. Mm. <laughs> and, but, but that's not a good thing. Like it, sometimes, like you say, sometimes it can be a good thing because you can act really fast. But yeah, I don't know. Like it's not the best. It's just my personality. Do you work with like obviously you have you have management now? Um, is there like more strategy behind your career when it comes to releasing music? Obviously, there has to be when you, especially when you're doing with major record labels. But like. Let's say, for instance, if you did an edit, would you just put it up and not even speak to your management, or would you yes. like? <laughs> yeah, how does I that just, work? The the only time I would hesitate to just put up an edit on SoundCloud is if I just released a really big single or something, and mm. I wanted all the focus to be on that. But in yeah. general, I would just like over Christmas, I put six edits on SoundCloud. Mm. Um, That's cool because I just I, I like I like I feel when, as a creator once you give things away and you let them belong to the people you can move on to the next thing and I feel like it frees up headspace for me I'm like yeah. okay I've given these away now and it what's next you know yeah yeah no I, I like that a lot and I kind of wish I was like that <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of wish I could just be like oh fuck it because there's records that I've been wanting to put out that we just know are never you know, you know those records they're just never going to come out but you still open and it's up like, the project every couple of months. Yeah, and like go back and listen to it. I play it like I don't know how much of your own music you play when you DJ, but like ninety five, ninety eight percent of my sets are my own music. Yeah, and you're just like I've got so many people asking for records, and you're like, well, this is never going to come out. But like, why? I, I, because there's other records that take priority. Of course, and is it something that you feel like? maybe it's perfect for your set but in the greater world maybe no one else wants it or something yeah or like maybe yeah there's like a level of that and also like there's a level of like I have this I have this edit of um, or it's a remix of Hans Zimmer time Mm. and like I get DMs every day about it pretty much yeah yeah. but have done for the last like three four years yeah and part of me has been trying to clear the sample for we've been trying to clear the sample for that long (laughs) And what and what's what's Hans Zimmer think of techno? Well, he's done it. <laughs> this is the thing. He, somebody out like Pete Tong did it with the orchestra. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, they they did it, but it's Pete Tong, so he, of course he can yep. he yep. can reach out to these people. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's I kind of wish I just like put shit out sometimes. Mm. Um, I want to. There's a there's a few things I'm really interested in. Um, and it's actually really interesting that you text me before going, I'm just about to do a Discord chat. Because <laughs> I really want to talk to you about your Discord. I have tried Discord multiple times and just not really gotten on with it. Okay. It's not really my favorite favorite platform, although I love the concept of it. Like, I really love the concept of it, but mm. I just haven't put the time and effort into it, if I'm totally honest. It's all on me. Um during covid 
I believe, please tell me if any of this is wrong, but during Go COVID, on. I believe you kind of really upped your game on the Discord channel. So the Discord, I think, may have been, well, it was probably in the tail end of COVID. Mm. Um, I think the, the, I, built, I built a community on YouTube. I was streaming yep. twice a week religiously yep. to uh, four hours of streaming on youtube a week and we had a huge community there and the yeah the discord was something that we put together after maybe a year or so of that yeah. um and it yeah it sort of became the the hub for the for the community how do you find it i honestly i'm gonna take my hat off i have an amazing team of moderators yeah. And sometimes I'll go a week without even being on there. Sometimes I'm active. Sometimes I'm really active. And when yeah. I am, I really enjoy it. Um, and I, I know there have been times where I've had to like set myself reminders to remember to go on Discord because it's so yeah. active in there. And I feel so bad when, when I don't participate. Yeah. Um, but when I, when I do go in there, it's, it's brilliant. And the people are just... There's, there's nothing like it. It's like you can go on Instagram and you can talk to people. But... You're talking to the whole world and there's always some asshole who's going to pop up and tell you you're an idiot or whatever. <laughs> Whereas, on, on, do you know what I mean? Like, and I, I put myself out there quite a lot. So I, I get I get quite a lot of haters as well. And, but when you go on your Discord, all of those people, they've opted in to join the James Hype community. Mm. And it's like, this is just so, it's so cool. The ego can... can, can can be happy there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> everyone's nice to you. Yeah. <laughs> no, that makes sense. I guess my question is it for like people that are listening that aren't as successful as, as where we're at, right? And not touring around the world. And mm. how much is community key and audience key for your growth in your career? So it's a big question. Like, because every artist is different. There are some artists yeah. who make huge records and don't have that community and they can still headline mm -hmm. festivals and things like that. And then there are some artists that have never made a big record in their lives, but they have such a great community that they can also headline a festival. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really individual. Um, and what I will say is I don't think as an artist, if you, you couldn't just set up a discord tomorrow and expect to have a community, it's like yeah. you have to have, it's a, the, the Discord doesn't make the community. The Discord is the, the hub for the community to all congregate in, you know? I agree. I totally agree. And was that a goal for you guys to, to do that? Or was it just something that you just set up just on the willy-nilly and, and it happened to work? I was pretty anxious when we started Discord because, yeah. because I was aware that it would require a lot of my time in order for it to be really successful. And I wasn't sure how much I had to give. And then I was also very aware that it can all go to shit so easily. Like if I didn't yeah. have great moderators, it could literally, I could literally turn up there one morning and it's just full of spam and everyone's hating on each other. And yeah, so it's, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's definitely not a one man job, you know? <clears throat> Does it help your records when you release? Does it help ticket sales? Does it help merch sales? Yeah. I mean, it's very hard to, it's very hard to quantify, but I'd imagine it does like, I'd imagine it does. The, th the thing is, when, when you release a record, imagine if we look at like my, my biggest record, Ferrari, has, it's got, yeah. I think it's got, more than, it's got more than half a billion streams on, for, on Spotify. And there's 8,000 members, no, sorry, 10,000 members in my Discord. So yeah. how much help can they really give? You know, <laughs> like they can, yeah, yeah, they can stream it maybe 100,000 times between them. But, but in the, like, it, I guess it helps. It helps the record with its little like kickstart, but then after that, it's it's out to the wider world and yeah. Yeah, I think that's the thing, though, isn't it? The kickstart at the beginning of a campaign is always the most important. Yeah. Um, where you hear about pre-saves, you hear about people putting adding it to their library. If you have like automatically like ten thousand people just adding it to their library before it comes out. Yeah. Spotify's like, what the fuck is going on with this record? <laughs> If you know what I mean, I, mm. I know I spoke to Hannah, Hannah Lang on the on the podcast, and she was mm. saying that like her the single that like went into the top charts and the the top ten in the UK, she had like 
a bunch of like her followers are like avid followers mm. and there was like 8,000 pre-saves before even like when the first pre-save th- yeah. link went up and I think that that matters massively yeah. nowadays yeah. because it, there's so much noise out there there's oh, so man. much noise of like I was told like over 100,000 records a day gets released this is wild isn't it how do you how have you seen the change since you started releasing 2016 to now so it's a good question um i think the biggest change has come from the perspective of record labels because record labels used to look for a good record yeah but now, because like you say, there's a hundred thousand records released every day. How many good records do you think there are? There's loads yeah. of them. There's probably loads of them. So it's not just a good record now. It's a good record plus a strategic way to make people listen to it. You know, so whether that's yeah, a, yep. a viral TikTok or even just 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 this week, I've had um, I played a clip from my set in New York. Uh, a while ago and I played this record that's signed to my label and it's not coming out yet and the clip's got 3.2 million views and wow. and I, I I knew it was a good record right and it's something that fits my set perfectly but since that clip has had that many views I've been hit up by two other record labels who thought it was my <laughs> record and wanted to sign it <laughs> but, 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 I, but, but I don't know if that's because it's a good record or if that's because it's got 3.2 million views do you understand totally I guess I guess also in kind of argument against that is it necessarily about it being a good record nowadays or is it about the virality what is a good record though you know, no, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I totally hear that because it's like I'm just playing devil's advocate because I think it's very easy, right? To like back in the day, it used to be like everyone would say a good record would shine through. Mm. A good record can't shine through now <laughs> unless you have a good yes. record with something else. Yes, yes, because someone, someone in their bedroom could make a good, someone in their bedroom with no no presence no followers could make a great record tomorrow and upload it straight to Spotify and yeah. without without any sort of marketing or anything no one would hear that record so it would never exactly. shine through even yeah. even even you or I could do that we we we'd, we'd, have... we'd have a better chance but i i hear what you're saying yeah and and i think this is the thing is like we could we could release a record with just randomly on a on a Friday and not tell anyone about it and it probably wouldn't do as well as it oh, would no, no. as if we were if we were TikToking it, if we were doing all yeah. of that and everything like that. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. So the role the role of an, an artist has changed from making the art into selling the art, you know? I always think selling the art is probably ninety percent of the ninety percent of the success now, you know? And I feel like you Tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you like the selling of the art. I wish I didn't have to sell the art. I yeah. really do. Um, none of us do, right? <laughs> but you're fucking good at it. I mean, you say this, but I still have fights with record labels when they're trying to make me do things. And, you know, like it's because nobody knows how to sell the art. Everybody, like I, I know how to, I know how to get views on the internet. Oh, I yeah. think I think I do. Sometimes I can get views on the internet. Like I can make DJ clips that go viral and things like that. But that's not always that doesn't always translate into it doesn't always go the way you want it to. I could have a brand new single and I, I can I can make every record go viral apart from my own brand new single sometimes. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. so it's 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 not it's not that straightforward. There is no and the the internet changes every day. Every every yeah. week something different works. So Anything that imagine you released a single six months ago, your strategy for that, that's not going to work for the next single. No, you know. So it's there's so much trial and error, and that's what I'm trying to do now with all of my social media is just forget everything that I know because I don't know anything. So all of the all of the stuff that I was doing in 2022, 2023, if 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 I if I find myself looking at a piece of content saying yes that's going to work because it worked before I'm like no yeah. forget that forget that try something totally fresh and different 
So I've been trying different kinds of content on my social media and... What have you been trying? I'm pulling your Instagram up now. I've, I, in the past three weeks, I've done two direct-to-camera iPhone video just being inspirational or what I hope is inspirational. Yeah. How did that go? Interesting. Um, <laughs> no, no, the first one did really well. The first one did a lot of views and the comments were insane, like thousands of comments. The second yeah. one... The second one, I posted it on New Year's Eve, like at New Year. So I think I posted it at a bit of a weird time, but I was in my hotel room and I was just like, do you know what? I'm going to send like a New Year message. And it did, it didn't do badly, but it it is still probably still got a thousand comments, which is pretty good, but it didn't do as well as the first one. But I think, um, I think it's just, it's just what is connecting on social media now is being true to yourself and being different from the because you know like you say on spotify there are hundred thousand records every day how many djs are on are on uh, instagram every day posting the video than playing a track i'm gonna google that how many posts <laughs> how many posts on instagram every day that's a fucking interesting one that didn't that didn't even give me the answer how many posts on not how often should I post, but how many <laughs> posts um, on go on IG daily? It must be billions. It, yeah, it probably is. It's not even giving me the answer. How? Oh, at least ninety-five million photos and videos are being posted each day on Instagram. Whoa. That was two thousand and three, two thousand and twenty-three. Yeah. And and the whole system's changed, so we don't even see we don't see the posts of the people we follow anymore. We see posts of no. We just see popular posts in general. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's yeah. You you the only way to shine through that is to dive deep into what is you and yeah. what makes you unique because everybody's unique. The worst yeah. thing the worst thing you can do is what works for someone else because it's probably not going to work for you. Yeah. Ha- I guess when obviously you've, you've had your, your 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 mate touring with you from the beginning, like b- before you could kind of afford having a team around you. Yeah. But how much <laughs> I really want to go into because I I know how much of an investment that is to have people tour with you all the time and having two tour tour uh, having two videographers photographers with you at all times is a huge expense as an artist, it right? <laughs> and it also but it also puts you in a situation where you if you have the, if you find the right person that person can really elevate your career on a social platform mm. overnight right how where, at what point in your career did you work out i need to invest in this massively and i'm yes i'm going to lose money this year i'm going to lose money for the next four years or I'm just going to break even in my career but what the out the benefit will then eventually get to get to mm. making profit or whatever that is well I was I was very fortunate in that the guy the guy that I was working with who was my old friend he um he worked for me for very little money when I didn't have mm. any money he was working for me for literally like a minimum wage type of amount yeah. um and that was that was a great a great relationship at the time um, and then after after COVID was when I thought I really thought I need to I need to have a deeper connection with my audience than anyone else is doing. And that's I came out of COVID having been doing two live streams a week, and the connection that I had to these people all over the world was insane. And yeah. I was honestly I I had gigs in my calendar everywhere, and I was terrified because. I wasn't going to be there for the live stream. Yeah. And all I thought was, was this is all going to fall apart because yeah. it's all built off this live stream that I can't do anymore. I can't make it for the mm-hmm. live stream. And I tried to make it work. And what I did at first, I was pre-recording things and I just didn't have the time. You know what it's like when you start traveling and it's, yeah, yeah. and so I, I made a decision to invest in a full-time videographer who's, sole job was to film a weekly YouTube series. 
Okay. And I'm still doing it to this day, and we do moving differently every week on a Monday. Yeah. And um, we're up to episode 83 now. And that's amazing. It, it's crazy. It's, it's the best. But when we go to shows and people, they feel like they're your best mate because they spent so much time invested into what we get up to on the tour. And it's that's that's the, the, the connection that I wanted to have with the people that I had through the live streams. And we managed to, it's not the same connection, but it's a it's still a very deep connection that we have through moving differently every week. And But that was a, like you say, that was a huge investment in money. And like all DJs, we all, we all went without getting paid at all throughout COVID, yeah. you know? So coming out of that, I was in a really cool place because I knew that I could survive, you know? <laughs> I was like, well, I don't really, <laughs> yeah. I don't really, I don't really need any money anymore, you know? <laughs> I, I kind of, I've kind of figured out how to survive without it. So um, the money that is coming in, I'm going to spend it flying this guy with me everywhere just to shoot a YouTube series. And yeah, yeah. and then as that's progressed, I sometimes have uh, two guys doing video as well so that we can have extra angles on the bigger shows and have a lighting and visuals guy now when we do um, big festivals and a tour manager as well. And like pre COVID I had one person, you know, so, <laughs> but, the, but, but as, um, but it's, it's literally priceless. I know, I never used to understand why a DJ would have a tour manager, but, but I think that's because I wasn't a big enough DJ to understand why it was necessary. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And yeah. when, when you start doing the big shows and when you start doing, two or three gigs in a day and crazy travel and all of that. You can't be doing that while being the artist, you know, that ha somebody has to take responsibility for that over your head. I totally agree. And I think when it, when there becomes a point where the shows are taking up so much artistical space in your head that you can't think of those mm. other things that need to be done. Like why is the decks not at the right height? Mm. Why, why is the tech rider not correct? Like, to the to the smallest detail like it is tough i i've never worked with the tour manager i've never i'm not that big of an artist where i need where i feel like i need that at this moment in time but i'm sure in in a day in time to come it will be like that and mm. i think for me is also that i really want to get into is the like the mental side of of there's two things having people tour with you how do you find that do you prefer people touring with you than touring alone? Like, how do, how does that help the like mental health of like the artistical the artist? I guess having a team is the best. I I love the guys that I tour with, and we all work together really well. Everybody plays their role. We all hate each other sometimes, you know, but that's what happens when you don't get enough sleep. Yeah. Um, however, having the right people is also very important because. I'm working with the wrong people and spending that much time with them in yeah in tough scenarios where you haven't had a lot of sleep that would that would be pretty horrible yeah so yeah ha having a team is great I, when I when I first got my US visa and I was first able to play in the USA it was 2022 and yeah and the USA had this rule that you could only come into the country if you had a special permission from the government or whatever. So I couldn't, I couldn't bring anyone with me on my first ever USA tour. So I did it by myself and it, it was, I don't mind being by myself. I'm a person who likes to spend time by myself, but I just found it so hard to find people who I could depend on when I went to different places. Like I was yeah. trying to find like, Oh, I'll get this guy to film video for me here. And it was, I was coordinating so much more than just my actual DJ set that it was really, really tough. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I think I, I think I do a lot better on the road with the team. It's, it's like, it's like you become part of a, it's like, it's almost like you become part of like a, a little family and when you're away yeah. from home, it's like you're in that family and that's sort of like your home when you're not at home. Totally. And yeah, yeah. So sometimes it can be, sometimes it can be like strange almost like mixing the two together, you know? Yeah, I, it is weird, isn't it? When you're on tour and then you come back mm -hmm. home and yeah. you're like, oh shit, the like transition of, mm -hmm. of reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so and walking down the street and just living a normal life. Yeah, yeah. I love it, personally, <laughs> I love it. Where, where I live in the UK is like the proper country. Yeah. So it's like, 
it's always a massive bit back down to reality like yeah, i literally yeah. go to the lo- go to the local shop and like one of the ladies in there was like oh are you still doing your dj <laughs> <laughs> yeah. she thinks like, she thinks you're playing at weddings and stuff yeah. literally yeah yeah asking if you can do a, her mm. daughter's 18th um but I, I think that's really important as well because i think there's a lot of I think it's it's different in the DJ world, but I think when you're going then into the pop star world, I think people are so famous that you literally just have to live a different life. You can't leave the house, right? We're very fortunate mm, that mm. we can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very fortunate. I couldn't even imagine what it'd be well, like uh, to be like Billy, I've, Billy Eilish. No, it's, it's, like it's, it's, it's honestly it's horrible because I, I've. I have tastes of it, you know, like we go to certain mm. places and you'll be feeling like crap and someone will want a photo with you in the airport. And I know I'll always make time to do a photo. I'm, I'm not saying that's, I'm not, I've, got, I've got no issue with that. But imagine that was everywhere you went all the time. Everywhere. It's, it's, it's horrible. I wouldn't go out. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere. Like it just, that would, that would be rough. Yeah. Um, you tour a lot. Um, how does that affect your ability to write music? Sometimes I think it helps and sometimes I think it hinders. Um, I, what I need is balance. When I have balance, I'm great. And obviously that sounds really simple, but it's not that, it's not that easy. Like if I, could, yeah. if, I can, if I can get a couple of days in my own studio and then a couple of days on the road, it's perfect. Because if I'm on a really long flight, like a flight to Vegas, I can make three tracks. It's crazy. Really? I, I work yeah. really well on planes, really well. Really? Mm. Um, but then, I, but then for finishing tracks, I need to be in my studio. But yeah. then sometimes I'll be really excited to get home to my studio, and I'll go and I'll lock myself in, get a load of energy drinks, and I'll make absolutely nothing. And I'll just, I'm just there, like, <laughs> what a waste of time. And then sometimes I'll be on a really shitty, like, easy jet flight, squashed in like this, making a banger, you know. So it's, it's I, yeah, I, I need, I need both. And then also the. the the, the clubs and the, the festivals that inspires me to make things, you know? So mm, if, if I was yeah. just at home in the studio for a month, I think I would, I would maybe even hit a low point of inspiration. Yeah, that makes sense. I've got the whole of February off. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm interested to see how that helps in the studio. Have you done it before? Um, not a whole month. Mm. No, never. Um, but <clears throat> I'm like, I've not been writing much club records recently. And it's also really weird because when I go back to writing club records, it's kind of like an interesting concept because it's, it's for me, it's harder to get into that mindset of like, I can write club records all day long, mm. but then there's writing club records and there's writing amazing club records. Of course, yeah. yeah. Right? We, we, can, we can all t- churn out records mm. left, right and center mm-hmm. because we've been doing it so long. It's like, it's, it's literally like riding a bike and I don't mean that in a, braggy way it's, mm. it's easy for us because we yeah, do it course, so often yeah. but then writing a, a club record that actually because it's not that simple it's not that hard a kick and bass and <laughs> a good kick a good bass That's and it. you, literally, some of the, some you of the, literally have a record <laughs> some of the best drops is just a great kick yeah <laughs> and it's, it's like create creating tension yeah. and and I, and I think it's not that hard but I think what the hard bit is is creating a record that reaches out to the masses that can sit in multiple sets Mm. in multiple environments and still work yes yes totally because because to make something that would fit in a 5 a.m underground set is one thing to to make something that would fit in a main stage festival set is another thing some records yeah. manage to do both and that's and they're the ones that they're the ones that everyone wishes they made that's the money shot yeah. right there literally it's like it's and it's hard to do that mm. and i think it, you can't even think about doing it do you do, when when you write do you think about where this is going to be played do you think about who's going to listen to this or are you just purely making for yourself i only do that in the really critical part where i start thinking everything's awful you know (laughs) um in general to be honest with you i i'm I'm in a nice place right now because i i feel like if i can play it then it's right that makes sense so whether i'm making a whether i'm making a commercial record for a major label or whether i'm making uh, a club record my only criteria is can i play this yeah and and if i can if i can tick that box then i'm getting somewhere happy days 
when it comes, I want to talk about commercial records. Obviously, Ferrari was an absolute game changer for mm. you and for the industry. Oh, thank right? you. Like, it was a moment in time where... When did it come out? It came out after COVID, right? Yes, 2020... Oh, my God, bro. 2022, summer 22. Um, was it yeah. summer? Maybe end of summer? July? Not sure. Let me pull it up. Should and probably then, know. Like, we can... Yeah, we... <laughs> anyway. Um, like... Where did what's the process of of writing that record? What's the where do you like start with that? Um, yeah, it came out in twenty twenty two. What I want to kind of just go into that a little bit more detail because you've had some big records, right? You've had 60, 60 million stream, twenty five million stream. Your most recent record, drums, sixteen million streams. Um, about had 72 and you, the more than friends record is 158 mm. right like and this is just on spotify mm. so when you're writing the more commercial side of your of your records what's the process of like doing this is it the case of somebody sending you top lines is it the case of working with other people is it like how what's the best way you work in that situation i can give different examples for everything that you that you've just said um please do yeah please do I think it's because I think it's really important because I think what a lot of people that listen to this don't realize that sometimes it takes a team to make a hit record and sometimes it doesn't take anybody apart from yourself. I'm going to go down my Spotify top 10 from today and tell you the, tell you the process from each one. Oh, I would if Spotify was loading. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's start with go, more Oh, yeah, you friends. tell me. Go on. So, so, more, more, than so more Than Friends. I made More Than Friends in 2016. Which and I was mm-hmm. I was a terrible producer. I was I was I'd been producing five years maybe, but I wasn't I didn't have all the skills. You know I I could make a I could make a, a kind of a club edit of a of a record or whatever. And I I was working with this guy at the time called Eddie Jenkins, and I can't I can't remember. You, you know Eddie? I know Eddie. <laughs> um, <laughs> And we we were working in the studio together every day. And yeah. when I worked with Eddie, it was incredible because I had a certain set of skills and Eddie had the complete opposite set of skills. And he's a great keys player. It, he's, I think he's a, I think he's a, um, a musical genius. We, yeah. we, we don't work together anymore. But, um, yeah, neither, neither do I. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he, I really do believe he's a musical genius. And we had, we had a, yeah, we, he's great. We worked together every day for months and months. Um, Mm. And he, his skills perfectly complemented my skills. I was great at making like drums and nasty sounds, yeah. and drops and all that, right? <laughs> and he's and he's got keys and he's instrumental. He's an amazing songwriter as well. And we were just we were just working on whatever whatever was on our minds. Some days we were writing songs. Some days some days we were even doing pop songs, like not even dance music. We were just doing some crazy stuff. Um, yeah, it was a great time. And I came to him with this idea of sampling on Vogue, Don't Let Go. And I'd made a million versions of this track. And then and Eddie came into the studio with me and he played these piano chords on it. And it, for me, it was a huge battle because I wanted to make a club record that was a little bit pop. And he yeah. wanted to make a full out pop record. So it was like a, a little of bit course. of a clash. And... We we had this turning point where the, the track's in F minor and Eddie put this F major chord in there and it's just it's just the magic of the whole record is the F major chord in the record and I hated it and, uh, and then and then I, I I grew to love it and it that that was a uh, that was number six in the charts in the UK um, so that wow. was my my first ever taste of any sort of musical success you know. Um, that's pretty soon into your start in your career of releasing records. Yeah, right? it is. Yeah, it was. Well, it was my second release technically. I think. Jesus, that's <laughs> mental. And the, the, what 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 pressure is that when that's oh, your second record? That was a lot. Of that was a lot of pressure. Like I, 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 yeah, I, yeah, I was. I had a, I had a bad few years of making music after that because of because of the pressure of that and because of just the kind of identity crisis of 
of course. Where, that, where that left me as well, because I, I wasn't a strong enough producer at the time to really know who I was. So I'd made this hit record, I'd signed to a major label, and everything that I was delivering them after More Than Friends, they were like, no, it's not good enough. No, it's not good enough. No, it's not a, yeah. it's not a hit. So I'm just there like, well, this is shit, isn't it? And yeah. I ended up, I ended up, honestly, I ended up making, making some music that I did. It didn't feel like me. It was like, I was just trying to fit their box. And because I didn't have enough of a profile, I couldn't really push back against them and I couldn't really give them what I wanted. So it, it, it put me in a bit of a bad spot, but that's, that, that's just a learning, learning curve of the whole thing. And that's, it's about being a strong enough person to be able to say what it is that you want to do and not get pushed around by the people who come with the big checks, you know? 100%. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of this conversation is that why audience nowadays is so key. If you have a massive audience, they're not necessarily even worrying about it. Do what the fuck you record. want. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Okay. So let's go... Uh, disconnected. Disconnected. All right. So um, disconnected. Twenty-seven million. Yeah, that's it's actually crazy that beat put number one as well. That was my first beat put number one. Big day for me. Was it really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So me and my fiance Tita Lau, we were in the studio and we weren't making music. I was probably trying to make music, and she was trying to tell me why she was unhappy, and she said that she felt a little. She she in she and I quote said I feel a little disconnected, and I was like. Say that again. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> and the song is there in my head. I heard the, 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 the triplet thing straight after it. It was there. And I was like, I need to get this out now. And that was it. And then the simplest bass groove ever, like boom, 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 boom. The whole track's just built yeah. off that. And it, it all just it pieced itself together so fast. Um, and then full transparency, I had a mixed down on this by a guy called Mark Maitland. Yeah. So um yeah, he he kind of brought the brought the sounds together on this one because my kick was a bit like Bleh. so he kind of um he kind of made all the sounds tighter because it's a very it slams when you play it, you know. Um so it wouldn't sound as good as it does if it wasn't for him. But yeah, all the production on that was by me. And then Tito on the vocals and a little mix down. Amazing. It's amazing what a mixed down engineer can do. Mm -hmm. It's amazing because they can literally make, it's that extra 10% of what a mixed engineer can do on a record and it can just turn it into pretty much a hit record. Mm. If it's a great record or anything, yeah, yeah, of course. it can literally turn it in from a, a, an amazing record to like a, like the, one of the best. Number one. Number one. Oh, this is, a, this is an interesting one. So Diplo reached out to me and which yeah. is really cool by the way uh, <laughs> sounds like i'm just really <laughs> casual about that but I, I wasn't casual um and he said that he was he wanted to make some sort of collab with me and major laser um and that's so cool for me because that's crazy bro for real that's crazy like as i said to you before i i used to be a hip-hop dj i used to play open format yeah. and stuff so i love major laser um yeah. like so i always feel like i'm more appropriate for that job than a lot of other house DJs because I have I sort of I, I've listened to a lot of that music so yeah I, I, I knew Diplo at the time was playing my track Say Yeah I don't know if you know that track um, I don't know well when you hear it you'll understand because it sounds just like number one okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I I just thought let me like I know what I know what Diplo likes about my sound so I'm gonna try and not clone it but like Put, so, oh, sorry, I skipped a step here. He sent me a load of acapellas of tracks that he thought could be house records. So I just started yeah. playing around with them and I just found this one repeated phrase in one of the one of the acapellas and I was like, that's so cool. Like, he's saying yeah. something cool. Anywhere we go, we are number one. And his, his yeah. voice sounded amazing. It sounded like a little bit like melodic in the way he's saying it. And I was just playing around with um, Granulator in Ableton. And throwing yeah. random stuff on it until I could find something that sounded like, and it's really like the the lead sound in number one is really like inharmonic, but it sort of okay. is a bit harmonic as well with the with the vocal. Um, and then in terms of the production on it, I just kind of copied what I'd done on Say Yeah because that for me that yeah. record worked, and I think that got like number yeah. number four on Beatport or something, so it did quite well as well in the in the the club world. Um, yeah, and again, Mark Maitland did a mix on that. 
Amazing, amazing. Did Diplo do much on it? So the big breakdown in the second half, that was his suggestion and it makes it so sick. So he, he was yeah. like, he was like, we need to put like a rave breakdown with a sample of um, a Jamaican sound clash. And he was, he was yeah, like yeah. sending me all these YouTube videos. And I was like, bro, you sent me like a two hour sound clash here. Like, what do you want me to do with this? So uh, I was like dig, digging through trying to find these samples. And then we, we put it all together and he, he, he was like sent me some feedback on it. And yeah, then we'd piece this thing together. So yeah, the, the initial kind of vocals came from Major Laser, and then... After I'd sent the track back to him, he was like, yeah, let's put this breakdown thing in. And then, yeah, that was it. That's amazing, man. It's amazing. Uh, you give me a feeling. You give me a feeling. Well, I started that during COVID and I used to play a version of it on my live streams, which, you, you know, when you, you know, you started an idea and you know it's not finished and you don't know how to finish it, but you're so in love with the idea yeah. that you're just like, I, I just, I remember living with this idea and it, didn't, it barely had any drums in it or anything. I was just like, I just love the bass line. I was like, I just love it. And um, yeah, I sent it to Vince's culture because it was during COVID and we, we were talking a bit because we were both, we were both doing lots of like YouTube videos and I think we both had this mutual yeah. respect for one another. Um, and he was like, yeah, I love it. Let's collab on it. Um, and I sent him all the stems and then he disappeared for a year. Um, and then I chased him up and I was like, are we still doing it? And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Disappeared again. And then I chased him again, like three months later or something. This is a lesson in following up because no one gets offended when you follow up, but everyone's scared to do it. Totally. And I, I speak for myself as well. Yeah, I'm always yeah. scared to do it. Um, and yeah, the third time I went back to him, he was like, okay, cool. So he did some work on it and he, he, um, he really transformed the record. The only bit that was... Well, the vocal was the vocal was there for my version, and then the bass yeah. the bass line was from my version. But he did all the drums on it and kind of made a different structure to it as well. And when he sent me, I hated it. <laughs> I was like, yeah. but but that's that's <laughs> the hard thing with collaboration is collaboration is compromise. And the hard thing about of course. when you're an artist, compromise is horrible. You don't want to do compromise. Yeah. So no. As soon as someone else works on your record, you're not going to like it as much as you did before, but you've got to like take a step back and see it through the bigger perspective because this is someone who's really successful and this is what he thinks it should sound like. You're not always 100%. right. <laughs> and they're not always right as well. Oh, true. And that's the thing. But that's, that's the compromise as well. It's like sometimes accepting that you think you might have had a great record before, but accepting that you actually have to be like you know what this might be better yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so yeah he sent, he sent me his version back and i think i changed the structure and made a radio edit and that was it amazing i love that i love that one um drums which is your latest single drums big process on this um so during covid i talk about this so much um i made <laughs> an instrumental track with that Justin Timberlake sample, the boom, boom, yeah. boom, boom. And it literally said before the drop, it said drums, do, 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 do. It yeah. was just that, right? And all of the viewers on the live stream used to love it when I played it. And <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, this is there's obviously something in this because people really like it. And I got in the studio with um, a couple of my good friends, um, Josh Grimmett from The Good Boys and Miggy De La Rosa, who sings on Ferrari, Johannes Shaw, and we wrote this we wrote this song on top of it and we were like oh it's a bit weird isn't it because the melodies are really dark and it's like I don't yeah. know if we really like this and we just lived with it for ages and then after ferrari had come out me and my manager were like what about that song that we did on drums and we went and listened to it again and we were like this is pretty good you know so yeah we um i i made i made a new version of it because the production was awful because it was it was just dead old <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, I made a new version, and then my manager was like, "Okay, we got to get we got to get someone really really popular to sing it." And um, he was like, "What do you think of Kim Petras?" And I didn't really know who Kim Petras was, so I checked out I yeah. checked out her Spotify, and she's got these like her latest album. She sounds like like old Britney Spears. It's the best. Yeah. Um, so I was like, "Okay, yeah, this could work." So we managed to piece it all together and we went out to LA and recorded Kim in the studio and it was proper like pop star shit, you know? Um, Love that. And then, yeah. Jesus Christ, she streams a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she was on the, on the Sam Smith record, Unholy. Yeah. 195th most streamed oh, in the wow. world. That's, That's crazy. 
Yeah, fair play. Fair play. Um, and then the big one, Ferrari. Ferrari. Um, again, it was a long one. Ferrari existed for three years before it came out. Like yeah. the actual version as well. It didn't even change. So the the really? initial Ferrari, I was just playing around. I, I Most of the time I, I work in the studio, I'm completely solo and that's how I like it. Yeah. And I was, I was just by myself late at night and listening to old R&B music. And I, list, I was listening to I Need a Girl Part 2 by P. Diddy and a bunch yeah. of other artists. Amazing track. And I just thought, okay, let me try and chop this guitar out literally like chopping the drums out and trying to make it into a house beat and i just just put it on like the most simple of drums and the yeah. simplest like nothingy bass line and i was like oh shit this is good isn't it <laughs> and um the next day or a couple of days later i had a studio session planned with all the guys i mentioned to you before um josh gromit miggy de la rosa and johannes shaw and i played them the beat and they were like yeah, that's fucking good. And we yeah. wrote Ferrari that day. We wrote the chorus of Ferrari that day. And we were all like, okay, this is really big, really big. And this is 2019, right? And we... Uh, so the, the uh, this at this point, the version of Ferrari sounded a lot different. Like the, the track was kind of... The, the track was kind of clunky. Like on the version now, yeah. the drums are quite... Gr like, like, like flowing, like it's... It's but yeah, the, yeah. the drums were like, like rigid, and <laughs> the idea of Ferrari that me and my manager had was that we were gonna have the chorus in the breakdown, and then put a rapper on the drop. And okay. it was a bit of a wild idea because it wasn't like something that anyone was doing, um, and we actually got. Um, like this, this, this will be this will be a big deal to people from the UK. We actually got Tiny Temper to record Sick. Ferrari. So the original Ferrari has Tiny Temper on it, and he's amazing on it as well. No way! So good. Like you grew up in the UK at the same time as me, so yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know how significant that is. Um, and yeah, so we got we had this version of, with a Ferrari with Tiny Temper on it for ages. And my record label I was signed to, Island. They, they were like, oh, we're not sure about this. We don't know if it's, yeah, we don't know if the, the radio stations will play it and all this bullshit. And, um, <laughs> and so the record never came out. It just got sat on a shelf, parked up. Wow. So we, we would, tr me and my manager, we were trying to like figure out what to do with it. We ended up getting another version with Tion Wayne on it. So I've got, I've got, <laughs> I've got rap verses on Ferrari from everyone, like for real. I even got a version of Ferrari. <laughs> No, I've never told anyone this. I even got a version of Ferrari where Sway Lee did a verse. No Sway way. Sway Lee, Ray Sremmed, Sway Lee did a verse on Ferrari. I'd love to hear I, that. I'll, I'll, I'd I'll, love to I'll hear dig that. it out and leak it one day. Um, yeah, you should. But yeah, the crazy thing is we had all of these people record parts to Ferrari and then the, the version that came out had none of them on it. Are you paying these people to no, do it? A lot of a lot of the rappers they'll record things on spec and then they will get paid yeah. if it gets released. Um, yeah, makes sense. So get paid a lot of money. Oh, yeah, as well. of course. Yeah, it's so, it's so easy for them, isn't it? Like me, me. It's so easy. If someone if someone pays me to do a remix, I've got to sit there in the studio. I've got to <laughs> test out all these ideas, make it sound right, mix it, all of this, right? Yeah. A rapper goes in there. They're like five seconds, like. Blah, blah, blah. Done, 50 grand. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah, thanks very much. I know, that, that's just me making every rap, every rap, every rapper ever sound like he has the easiest job in the world. It's definitely not. <laughs> uh, so, but it, it, I, think it's, I think it's people that just generally are great musicians. Like, I, I wouldn't class myself as a great musician because I can produce well and I can work, the stu work well in the studio. But, like, for me, like, a great pianist, a great singer a great songwriter is they don't need any tools apart yeah. from them yeah 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 which is really it's a, it's a completely different concept to me um but again it's the same with rappers they're just talents mm. that for me that i would never be able it's to it's like do an instrument isn't it yeah yeah 100 percent. so 100 percent. Fer so, ferrari ferrari let, let me finish this so after after all these versions exist and the record they don't think any of them are good enough um for whatever political reason they had, you know, um, we we were just ticking away, 
being James Hype, released Disconnected, released Dancing, released all these club records. Yeah. My career was going great. It really was. And <laughs> like I'd, I'd really found I'd really found my feet as a producer and the and my I was I was like selling loads of tickets all over the world, like nowhere near what, what I'm doing post Ferrari. But I was really happy with yeah. where I was at, right? And then yeah. I got a call or my, my manager got a call from a well known radio presenter who I will not name, who said, You are not gonna believe what's happened. Someone has copied Ferrari and it's coming out on a major label. What? Mm -hmm. And my, I, I have two managers and they were both on the phone with me straight away. And this was like one day before I was about to go on a USA tour. So I had no time. And basically they said, you need to finish Ferrari because it's coming out tomorrow. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Because we, so, so the great thing that happened here was the copycat version of Ferrari was very cheesy and commercial. Yeah. So we were under the we were under the impression that it was going to come out on a date two weeks from now. So yeah. my manager was being quite strategic with this, and he thought, okay, well, this this version of this copycat version of Ferrari, it's cheesy and it's commercial. So why don't we make why don't we just release your club version as our version? so that they don't sit in the same yeah. way. The copycat version is the cheesy version, and then your version yeah. is the cool version that all the DJs want to play. So yeah. we ended up releasing my version as, we, we ended up releasing my club remix of Ferrari as Ferrari. Yeah. And as soon as the record came out, it had so much support that the other version got canceled. Really? Um, but yeah, that, that copycat version, thank you, is the best. <laughs> yeah because it would never have come out yeah exactly or maybe yeah no it probably, probably would never have come out it's crazy it's really crazy and that's an amazing yeah story. i just remember the feeling when my manager called me and i it was like it was like 11 p.m and i was in my apartment and he was like and, and i was literally i got in my car and went to the studio to finish the record because it had to come out we had to submit it to like spotify the next day wow <laughs> that's amazing but it's also amazing to have a team that's that that can like pivot that yeah, quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not many people, not many people have that. That's so important. I think, I think what to be able to have what that. really helped there was that my manager was so in love with the record. Me and my manager were in yeah. love with this record, and we we'd both been fighting against the label. Like we need to release this, you know. So yeah. because we were both so passionate about it, where others other people might have just let it go and said, "Oh, we lost this one," then we made it work. I guess in question to that is not giving up on records and giving up on records when for you is there a time to not give up on a record or to give up on a record like when is it that does, does it ever change where you're like actually maybe they're right this record isn't that good at first I was going to say I've never given up on a record but I think I have I think yeah. I have I think there's, there's definitely been <laughs> there have been moments where You've played it to your manager and he's been like, mm. you've played it to your girlfriend and she's been like, mm. you've played it at a club. <laughs> the dance floor is like, mm. yeah, <laughs> I think that's the great thing with being a DJ though. When you're a producer is you can, you can get that instant feedback on, on what you've yeah. made. And obviously people aren't going to necessarily react amazingly to something they've never heard before, but it is still quite a good indicator of, of how it feels. I think it also goes back to what we were saying about just a good kick and bass. It's easy to make a crowd react <laughs> in a club. It's, it's really easy. Just give them, the, think... give them the, the horn from losing it and a kick drum. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but when I think I've, I've been noticing it recently with, with my newer stuff that's coming out this year, like when you're actually writing songs that work in a club, but they are realistically songs, it takes people time and it, whether it takes people to the second breakdown to mm. understand what's going on or whether it takes them a second listen or like to listen back to the video or they're trying to shazam it or something like that it's not necessarily like just a great club record it's about is it a great club record and is it a great mm. song and does it work 
everywhere rather than just a club because i think if you have a i've got records that most of my records just work in yeah, clubs yeah, yeah, yeah. and they serve they serve a massive tool for just working yeah, in clubs yeah, yeah. and people listen to them when they're getting ready but people aren't fucking listening to them when they're doing a dish yeah. people aren't listening to them like <laughs> when they're having a rack relaxing mm. even in it out mm-hmm. you know what i mean i guess that's the thing is like you never know until it happens did you know ferrari was going to do that no, I didn't know it was going to do that, but I knew it was a hit. I, yeah. I mean, there's, there's levels of hit, aren't there? Like, if, if you'd yeah. have asked me in 2021, how many streams will Ferrari get? I'd have said over 100 million. Yeah. But I wouldn't have said 2 that's billion, amazing. which it has. Yeah, so, that's crazy. I, like, bro, I went to, I went to, I, I'll never forget in 2023, like the start of the year, I went to Uruguay. Like, I, I, my, I, I'm, I'm going to sound very ignorant here, but I've never even heard of Uruguay. And I went there and it's, it's, yeah. it's a country in South America and the people were just incredible. And the way they were singing the words to Ferrari, it was just like wild, bro. Like a place I've never even mm. heard of. And like, like, like what you were saying a minute ago about songs, there's something like as a producer, I imagine you're very much like me where you like to think that we could just make a really cool groove and maybe a little synth yeah. and it will be a massive hit. But there's something that you cannot... You, you can't do better than what a song does. People are emotionally attached totally. to it. And yeah, that, that'll connect with them in such a deeper way than a synth and a kick drum ever will. I agree. I agree. And I think it also brings back memories to certain situations and lyrics mean something mm. to people and melody means something to people. And I think like, let's just say, for instance, like look what Rufus the Soul mm. have done, right? And look what like disclosure yeah, yeah. and, and the, 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 the bands that are in the electronic world that create songs like and look what you've done it with Ferrari, if you know what I mean. You've done it you've done it multiple times, but Ferrari happened to be mm. that one at that time. It hit, hit it was a great record. It, it's it's a, I think I'd like to get your your opinion on it, but I think it's a, a matter of multiple things. It's a great record, you've got a solid audience and timing was great that you've got three things that really help a record. Yeah. And, and once that, if you take one of those things out, I feel like nowadays it doesn't necessarily happen, yeah. but it happens. And, and there's also a level of luck. You make your own luck, but there is also a level of, of luck is, yeah. in this industry. Of course there is. Like, no, I might not have been informed that the copycat version was coming out, you know? But um, yeah, the, the timing mm-hmm. is so important. Like the, the, the great thing with Ferrari is it didn't sound like anything else. Like, okay, yeah. the, the drums sound like 909 drums and the, the bass sounds like another Tech House track you may have heard, but the, there's nothing to compare it to that has that hooky guitar as in, instead, of a, yeah. instead of a sound on the drop. And there's nothing that... So when people are listening to 100,000 new records every single day, it's nice to have something that doesn't yeah. sound like anything else. So that's, and that's a timing thing, you know, because... But it's... it's it, I, it, I agree. I it's agree. Also, it also comes down to having or not being afraid to have your own sound as a producer as well because it's mm. so easy it's actually easier than ever to sound like everyone else because everybody's getting the same sounds and everybody's like i could i could somebody asked me on my instagram the other day like what would you advise buying so what would you advise buying sample packs to a new producer and i was like yeah i, I my response was it's a good way to sound like your favorite artist but it's also a good way yeah. to sound like 99 percent of other people 100 percent 100 percent it's it's a very interesting market right now and it has been i think i think covid changed it if i'm honest because it became a like spliced for example became a way for artists to make money yeah um and a lot of big artists started making sample packs and then everyone started sound like it sound like <laughs> them or it became it became a more of a commercial market where let's just use fish for example right losing it mm. came out fucking took the world to storm then everyone's like i need to make a record like that because if i make a record like that it's going to be just successful be however yeah. people don't realize yeah people don't realize you're never going to be fish mm-hmm. you're never going to be james mm-hmm. hype and you're never going to be will yeah. clark like no one is ever going to be you or mm-hmm. that person you can so why try and be that person? Why try and make that person? Like, there's not another Nirvana because, out because there. Because the, sca- there's, there's never the scariest be. thing is to 
find your own path and walk down it. So the easiest thing is to find someone else's path and attempt to walk down that, I guess. I, I agree, and I think there's also a level of doing it for the wrong thing. Well, I, producing's hard, man. DJ's yeah. fun. <laughs> so maybe... Yeah. And also, like, becoming famous looks like mm, it's fun, mm. right? Beca like, earning a shit ton of money to play shows looks like it's a lot of fun, mm. right? So what's the, what's the quickest way to there success? There you go, make losing it. Make and losing what's it the quickest way to make over. losing it? Download the sample pack and, yeah, like... Exactly. You can, you can, you can see yeah. the logic, totally. But... but, but I, I see it totally. Obviously, well, you yeah. and I, we, we have experience in the industry, so we know that that's not the way... That's, that, that way's not really going to get you anywhere. But if you were new... No. If, you, if you were new, you probably would think the same thing. Oh, 100%. Yeah, like, how many Fred Agains are there now? Yeah. Like, it's just like... It's, it's, it makes sense. It's the same in everything, right? It's like when something becomes popular, everyone tries to do their own version of it until it becomes not popular. Mm. And there's a lot of artists that have been very successful at copying for many years, and then eventually they find their sound and then they yeah. do well. <laughs> it, it does, there, is, there, is a, yeah. there is a time that it, it takes mm. time. Um, but I want to go back from your first record or second record, More, More yeah. Than Friends, and you spoke about the like the pressure of that from uh, like afterwards. I want to kind of compare the pressure from that record to Ferrari. Is there still the same pressure to release another massive hit? Like if I like just on Spotify, okay, let's say two two billion streams overall. Like that's fucking hard to top, right? That's that's really hard to top. It's very doable, and I. 100% believe in you that you can 100% do it however what is that pressure that you're going through is there pressure or are you way more relaxed about it there is there is an element of pressure but at the same time as I said to you earlier I was selling loads of tickets before Ferrari came out I'd, f I'd found yeah. who I was and I was already really happy so and I was already making music that I was really happy with, and I, st and I still yeah. am. So the, the, if anything, the pressure is more to avoid the pressure, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. Like, because it would be quite easy for me to succumb to the pressure and spend all my time trying to make the next Ferrari. But I didn't make Ferrari yeah. by trying to make Ferrari, you know? I made Ferrari by playing around with yeah, music yeah. and having fun. So the, the, the best thing that I can do is just carry on being me making the music that really excites me and connecting with my audience online. And then I can just always be in the position to grab that Ferrari when it yeah. appears, because it will appear, you know, as a, as a creative, things just pop into your head yeah. one day and there it is. I love that. That was the response I was looking <laughs> for. <laughs> but it, it also shows massive development in you, in you as a human being, as an artist as well, is that it's like you go back from that first record to having all the pressure yeah. in the world. You now have one of the biggest records in the industry and the pressure is not to be pressured. The, the record I released straight off the Ferrari was Helicopter, which was literally... <laughs> it was, it was, it's the most techno record I've ever made. Like it was, it has, it has one vocal, which goes helicopter. That's it. So it's, yeah. Yeah. And that was almost the, that was always the middle finger to anyone who's expecting the, uh, the follow up to be Ferrari. Yeah. But I think that's really interesting though, isn't it? Because it's like, it just goes to show that you can just do what you want. It doesn't fucking matter. If you're, if like, you're true to yourself, then you can't, yeah. you can't, you go wrong. Yeah, I love that, man. Let's wrap that up on this. Um, how can people follow you? How can people get involved in the James Hype train um, and tell tell the people? Go to YouTube. That's where that's where you want to deep deep dive into me. Go to YouTube because I love YouTube. I'm all in on YouTube. And then at James Hype everywhere else. I love YouTube as well. And I've never gone all in on YouTube. Would you advise it? It's big work. It's big work. And also it takes... Yeah takes time to build it's also saturated as hell so you need to find you find your niche you know um <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know like do you know what there's not a lot of artists doing music production stuff on youtube i i started recently um 
and I was astounded by the numbers that I did on it because I my, my really? YouTube is built off my DJing so I, I always had this yeah. mindset that oh if I do anything other than DJ skills no one wants to watch but yeah. I so I put up my first um, like basically I did a Twitch stream I was making a remix on Twitch and I recorded the whole thing and just uploaded it onto YouTube and it's got like quarter of a million views in a, in two months or something. And wow. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, amazing. So yeah, I think that there, there are a lot of great YouTubers who do music production tutorials, but there's not many artists doing it. So that, so that could be yeah. for you. That's sorry, sorry t- tutorials, the wrong word. I wasn't doing tutorials. I'm just showing my work, you know? Because tutorial. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's... People love it. I used to, I did it, I did like four videos years mm. ago and people mm. liked it. People would still ask you for it. But again, it goes back to that time, how much time you, you need to put into it all and then how much time does that take away from writing music? It's about what you actually enjoy though as well because I find I yeah. actually, when I make a video, I walk away from it feeling alive. I love it. Buzzed, mm. yeah. I love that. That's dope. Mate, thank, thank you, you so man, much for coming on. Um, yeah, no, really, really enjoy that. Keep safe, and I will probably see you on the That's road right, at some we'll point. See you soon. And that is a wrap. Big love to James for coming on. Big love to all of you for listening. Please like, share, give us a subscribe. Keep safe. See you next time.